There is an old Rolling Stone song that goes, you can't always get what you want. That seems to sum up my experience of the Gospel of Matthew. I know this seems to be a common preface to reflections by both Sandy and me, um, and we promise that we will stop once we're through Matthew. If only we could pick and choose, then surely we could find some passages that are easier to deal with. But of course, being faithful followers of the lectionary, we deal with what comes along. And what comes along this morning is this encounter between Jesus and Peter and the profound question that Jesus asks. But before we begin, let's just take a moment in prayer. May the words of my mouth, the questions in our hearts, the answers on our lips, all our knowing and our unknowing, the offerings of our love to you, O oh God. Amen. But who do you say I am? This question that Jesus asks his disciples he also asks each one of us. And it is one that I have been struggling with or more likely avoiding for much of my life. So some background. I was born and bred into the United Church. My twin sister Susan and I were baptized as babies in Calgary by our mom's uncle, the Reverend Aubrey Tuttle who was at the time the moderator of the United Church of Canada. So there's some lineage there. We were part of the large contingent of Sunday school students here at Highlands in the late 50s and early 60s. Yes, I am that old. And we were confirmed in our grade 11 year. Now for many, confirmation is a very significant event in their lives. But to be honest, I really don't remember it. I know that will be deeply disappointing to both Sandy and Andrea, who I'm sure have very vivid memories of their confirmation. See, it should have been you two that were up here doing this <laughs> rather than me. Anyway, um, I was one of the many that came to church because that's what we did. That's what everyone did in those days. And yet, I continued to come to church when all, even when all my friends had stopped coming. So maybe there was something that was at work, something about this Christian faith that had caught my attention even at that early age. Fast forward a few years, and I'm in second year at UBC, and I have joined a fraternity. At one of our Wednesday evening meetings, Campus Crusade for Christ came and spoke. Now, I'm not quite sure how that came about, as fraternities were not exactly a hotbed of religious fervor. They may be, have been a hotbed of other things, but not that. <clears throat> anyway, they were there, they spoke, and at the end of the presentation, they asked us all to bow our heads in prayer, and then came the come to Jesus moment. It was subtle, just asking anyone who wanted some information or conversation to put up their hand. My head was bowed. Hesitantly, my hand went up and then quickly shot back down again. It was like there was this little fellow on my right shoulder that was whispering to me, this is good stuff. You should learn about them, more about this. And another little fellow was on this shoulder over here saying, put that hand down. What the heck do you think you're doing? Of course, it was too late. They had seen my hand, and this really nice young guy came up to me and managed to get my name and suggested we meet for coffee and a chat. Not being very quick-witted, quick which twas ever thus, I couldn't think of any reason to say no. So we met a few days later in the coffee shop at the Student Union building. 
We talked about football and about music and our classes. And then he asked the question, are you saved? Oh boy. I hummed and I hawed and I said, maybe. I don't know for sure. I haven't really thought about it. Um, what does that exactly mean? Then he started drawing pictures on a pad of a cute little train, like the little wooden ones we had as kids. And then he said something like, so this station over here is God, and this station over there is you. And there's a whole lot of sin and depravity in between you and the train. Well, that's Jesus. And Jesus is the way you get to God, the only way. And to get on board that train, you've got to take Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior. And you really need to do that right now. Well, I wasn't quite ready to do that. Said, well, let me think about it. Uh, begged off saying I had a class that I had to get to. I'm sure that was true. And then spent the next month avoiding his phone calls to the beta house where I was living. I didn't see him again. But the conversation may have triggered something in me. I even took a religious studies course the next year. The theology he spoke of seemed rather simplistic and literalistic, and I knew that he was in a place that I would probably never be. But then again, it may have sparked a, a return to this faith journey that I am still on. A few years later, in my theater days, I was touring the province in a production of Godspell. I loved the humor and the pathos and the irreverence and the humanness of how the stories of Jesus were told, those stories mostly coming from the Gospel of Matthew. And I appreciated how the show seemed to make those stories and Jesus so accessible. Of course, they didn't please everybody. I remember having a conversation with a young Christian who was appalled by what we were doing, how we were portraying Jesus and his disciples as clowns. His rigid understanding of Jesus didn't enable him to see Jesus in a different way. As a wisdom storyteller who often used humor to teach about the kingdom, and the inclusive love that God has for all of God's people. Now, in our early years, Cheryl, being the good Baptist that she was, took me to a variety of Baptist and Alliance churches. My discomfort was quite apparent. And so more and more frequently, we showed up here at Highlands. I had come full circle, and this, of course, has been home to both of us and our family for many years. And yet, I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that question. Who do you say I am? Peter and the other disciples have been traveling with Jesus for months. They have heard and experienced all the remarkable things that he has said and done firsthand. Their lives have been irre irrevocably changed. So when Jesus asks them the question, Peter is the one who is quick to respond. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter is the impulsive one, the very human one. Only a short time later, Peter will be admonished by Jesus for getting in the way of his plan to go to Jerusalem. And we know how he forsakes the Messiah after Jesus is arrested and put on trial, claiming that he does not know the man. So despite his declaration, I'm not sure that Peter truly understood what his confession meant. His people had been waiting for the Messiah for centuries. The district of Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus and the disciples had arrived in, was the northern heart of the Roman-occupied Palestine. 
They were a subjugated people in a conquered land, ruled by the cruelty and power of Rome and their own puppet king, Herod. The Hebrew people were desperate for a Messiah king to rise up and shake off the yoke of their oppressors with cudgel and sword if necessary. We don't know if that was the Messiah that Peter longed for, but it certainly wasn't the one that he got. Yet in this moment, Jesus blessed him and proclaimed that Peter would be the rock upon which he would build his church. The truth is, it is really hard to put into words who Jesus was and is. Some Christians seem to have him bound tightly into a box from where he confirms their judgment of others, their exclusion of others who are not included in God's love. His importance being limited to saving souls and guaranteeing entrance into heaven, wherever and whatever that is. For me, well, I will leave the judgment and the saving and the heaven part in God's hands. And I will look more to Jesus and how he lived his life, who he included, who he loved, as a way to follow and a way to live. Our theology, our constructs of our faith, were not meant to build walls of inclusion, exclusion behind which we can hide because we are on the inside and others are not. Jesus challenged the religious leaders of the day, the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees who let the law become a barrier rather than a pathway between God and God's people. Barbara Brown Taylor describes them in this way. From our safe distance, it's easy to make the Pharisees the bad guys, but they are just doing their job. They are the defenders of the faith. They are the religious authorities in charge of keeping holy things holy. And they did not like Jesus' type. He passes himself off as a believer in God. But that is not how he sounds to them. He sounds, sounds like a rival, one of those dangerously attractive preachers who get carried away by their own charisma and get the message all confused with the messenger. There are numerous itinerant preachers wandering the Palestinian countryside who claim to be the Messiah and the Pharisees. We're right about them. But with the hindsight of history, we know they were wrong about Jesus. So you will have noticed that I still haven't answered the question, who do you say that I am? I'm not sure that I will ever be able to answer it. I'm not sure that I can ever find words that are adequate. But if I try, then I would say that Jesus for me is the one who reveals the heart of God. He embodies all the hopes and dreams God has for each one of us and for all creation. He is the way of compassion. He is the promise of the possible. He is the breath of life. He is the one who takes on a journey of hope and forgiveness. He is the one who shows us how much we are loved by God, a love that is more powerful than fear and hate and death. I know those are a lot of words, and like Peter, I can say the words, but have they really sunk in? And can I live into those words so that they shape the life that I live? Because in the end, that is what Jesus asks of us. How will you live your life? Who will you feed? For whom will you show compassion? What will make you so angry that you must speak out and you must act? Who do you want to be? Can you see yourself when you see Jesus? 
This is who Barbara Brown Taylor sees. And I'll leave you with her words. When you look at him, you see God. When you listen to him, you hear God. Not because he has taken God's place, but because he is the clear window God has glazed into human flesh and blood, the portal between this world and the next, the passageway between heaven and earth. Amen.